is Ryan Miller, and for the past 15 years, I've helped hundreds of people to raise millions of dollars for their funds and for their startups. If you're serious about raising money, launching your business, or taking your life to the next level, this show will give you the answers so that you too can enjoy your pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. Does it ever feel like investment bankers don't tell you the full story on how they make their clients rich on their IPO? Well, my next guest is one of those investment bankers and has built an investment fund to half a billion dollars in just a few years from what is called a TRA strategy. It's making his clients insanely rich, and he's going to show you how you can do it too while still hedging against rising taxes. All this and more coming right now. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Andy Lee. Andy is the founder and CIO of a $500 million fund called Parallaxis Capital. Andy and his team have built their fund by providing access to investing in a fascinating asset called tax receivable agreements for institutional investors. He's been featured in publications such as Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Capital Allocators, NBC, Forbes, and more. So what does this mean? Well, this means that Andy understands how to build a fund, raise capital, and provide steady cash flow to his investors. So Andy, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. I've been a fan of some of the content that you've put out, educating your audience about some things that are somewhat esoteric. Might that be search funds, among others? Like It's a real educational resource that you're delivering to this community. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah, well, we're thankful for you. We've been rated in uh, some of the top 5% in the world, and it's all because of amazing guests just like you. So we're happy to have you on the show, calling all the way in from the Big Apple. So let's jump right into it. Let's talk about tax receivable agreements. Just like any alternative investment manager, we invest in alternatives. Now, this one is a new one that I've never heard of. And when you and I spoke before the show, I really got a good sense of what this is and how valuable that you're onto. So maybe you can help me understand and for the audience, just walk us through real basics. What is a TRA tax receivable agreement? Yeah. TRAs remind many of what pharmaceutical royalties were in the early 2000s, as well as what musical royalties were in the 2010s. Long dated annuity like cash flows that are uncorrelated to broader market indices. And so as we think about the evolution of the capital markets associated with those other opportunity sets, that's what we're looking to deliver our investors uncorrelated cash yielding um, streams of cash flows. In terms of what we're doing, think about a TRA simplistically as a factoring arrangement between two obligors. So an example of that might be H&R Block. Here in the U.S., we file our taxes on April 15 of a given year. And the U.S. government might say, Ryan, you've been a phenomenal citizen of the U.S. We're going to pay you $1,000 in two weeks. H&R Block might say, Ryan, instead of waiting two weeks for the money, why don't I just give you $900 today for that $1,000 in two weeks? Just a factoring arrangement, delivering dollars today in return for more dollars over time. We do that for public companies, names such as a Remax, a Shake Shack, a Duffenfeld, large public obligors um, that are investment grade to near investment grade in terms of credit rating. And we do that for as long as 10 plus years. That's all we do in a nutshell. Wow, that's brilliant. I'm just curious, maybe you could talk about, let's unpack that a little bit. So where does a, a TRA or a tax receivable agreement, how is that generated? Like, where do these things come from? And the reason why I ask is, are there people that may have an asset, not realizing they have an asset and actually can monetize something that they thought they couldn't? So maybe if you could talk about how those get created, like I'm five, so keep it simple, go easy on me, but a very simple explanation, how are these created? Absolutely. So if I thought about tax more generally, it's the largest asset class in the world that no one has fully appreciated. So the example that I gave you on personal income taxes is an example where most people aren't even aware that they could factor their future refunds. In the same way, what we do is for the companies that we target, every company has inherent tax attributes associated with themselves. That could include things such as net operating losses, stock-based compensation that they're paying to their em uh, employees, all the way to tax transformation transactions from a structuring perspective, such as a 338H10, or from an asset sale, or a step-up transaction whenever a party sells a piece of real estate from one person to another. For what we do very specifically, we do it only associated with public names. And so they here in the U.S., in order to be public, you need to be a C-Corp, unless you are an asset holder, that being an MLP, a RE, a BDC, an interval fund, an ETF, among others. If you are going public as an operating company, you need to be a C-Corp. And so businesses 
that were in LLC format, a past partnership, a part, um, an LLP, among others, they make a transfer tax transformation whenever they go public into a C-Corp. And during that transaction, they create large tax assets for the public shareholders for which these companies are then sharing back their tax, um, the savings associated with the transactions to these holders via the creation of a tax receivable agreement. These agreements may last as long as 10 to 15 years. And so these underlying obligors have a nice long data annuity stream. And that might be something that they may desire to monetize longer term. And that's where we step in. Okay. So that's, that's kind of where they come from. Now, I know when you and I and you're you're introducing this concept to me, it was fascinating. And so I know there's you're converting to a C corp. This is typically when you go public and then you go through that IPO process. And when you do that switch over, sometimes from your regular corp to we call it the UPSI. And then when that happens, is that the moment that that new asset is created? Absolutely. Okay. That's so right. it's, it's, okay. quick study. <laughs> Thank you. I got a good teacher named Andy Lee. So I uh, appreciate that. So that's the cool thing is that you basically say, I have this asset now. I'm about to go public. You fill out your paperwork. You're ready to go. And this new asset, this tax receivable agreement um, is you have the right to receive some type of value from the government through taxation. And then funds like Parallaxis and Andy, they come in and say, hey, do you want to cash that out rather than waiting a very long time to kind of get drip fed these these little nuggets over time? How about we cash you out right now? Uh, How am I doing so far? Absolutely. That's how it works. Awesome, man. And so you built a fund, Parallax's Capital, at about $500 million under management doing that. Why would a shareholder sell to you or anybody with the fund? Why don't they just keep it? What have you found? It's a function of the constituents. That, so that might be one, private equity funds, two, co-investors of those private equity funds, and finally, founders and management team members. So let's hit the first two in order. For a private equity fund and their co-investors, oftentimes they have finite fund lives. So typically a private equity fund would raise for a 10-year duration with several extensions. But by the time you get to year 12 to 14 and you've taken a company public, sold down your equity, and then you're stuck with a asset that might last another 10, 15, 20 years, your LPs are like, hey, we've had a successful fund. Let's just close it out, sell the assets and move on. Nobody wants a K1 for $10 for the next 10 years. And so in that regard, Private equity funds and co-investors are looking to close out a successful investment and sell due to finite fund life considerations. That's the first item that I would focus on. And on the other side of the equation, you then have individuals, oftentimes founders, management team members, who might, for estate purposes, want to simplify their affairs. And so they want to sell. They are thinking about their next generation who might not appreciate an annuity. A individual who's 60 might appreciate an annuity. A 24-year-old kid might not. And so they're like, how do I sell this annuity and give my kid cash and simplify their affairs? Because they're not going to know what to do with this. So that's one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, you then have individuals such as who might say, I, Ryan, gave me the opportunity to invest in something that's going to be 100x. Where do I get the cash? How do I sell something in order to get cash that allows me access to this 100x opportunity? Hey. There's this non-core asset. It's been cash flowing through a few years. It's cute. I don't quite understand it, but it's enough money that I can go invest in with Ryan. Wonderful. We're happy to deliver liquidity for any of those range of situations, delivering a solution uh, with the goal of getting money today in return for hopefully more money over time. Brilliant. So it's just a way of taking something illiquid and you can transfer it to liquidity. But you know, to also answer the the question... Um, I think I'm hearing is why would they sell to you? So liquidity, but also you can roll a, I think you taught, taught me this is just rolling an unproductive asset into a productive asset to say, yep, it's been locked up. Let me unlock this cash. I can roll it forward. So for those who are capital raisers, did we just discover a new strategy? And so if there are people who have sold out of a company or are about to, and you're talking to them, this is an area you can explore and you bring in people like Andy, and you can you might even be able to say, hey, Andy, this guy might want to liquidate. He's about to sell his company. He might want to liquidate his tax receivable asset. And then maybe you figure out some kind of liquidity. So this is, could be another way to unlock liquidity for you capital raisers out there. I know you follow me. I see you. So for the capital raisers out there, this is another way of saying, how do we take things and just start moving these uh, assets around to unlock a little more liquidity? Would you say that would also be a productive use of a TRA? Absolutely. Look. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, we're all selling solutions, right? And not all things are 
to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. This isn't all things to all people, but in the right situation um, for those intellectually curious, that provides a solution of incremental value that one can deliver in order to unlock, to Ryan's point, value on the capital raising side. That's brilliant. I love that. As you and I have got to know each other, you've told me a few stories. So I'm curious, you alluded to a little bit in the beginning. I wonder if you can unpack it and just talk about why is, say, Royalty Pharma Parallax's true North Star? Absolutely. So there's a business called Royalty Pharma that's traded on the NASDAQ. Ticker is RPRX, and it's an incredible business. Um, They started in 95, one of the pioneers in the pharmaceutical royalty space. So think about them as buying royalties associated with your favorite drug. And in that regard, every time you pay $10 for a drug, they may get a dollar of that um, revenue. And so they've done that for probably 40 of the largest drugs here in the U.S., and they're just getting a passive royalty associated with that. And that's something that's incredibly valuable, especially in historically when we were in a yield served environment, being able to deliver some yield as well as growth on future deployments is something that's incredibly valuable. And so for us, as we think about our growth as a firm, our goal is to be able to deliver that same uncorrelated yield to public investors. And so with time, that is includes a contemplated potential listing as we are able to scale our asset base to meet the needs of the public investor. Brilliant. And, you know, that being said, I'm curious, like, who can invest in TRAs? I'd love to know uh, your your perspective being in this industry for a while. Who are those people that invest in these things? Yeah. So for us, at least primarily driven by um, the firm that I came out of, I came out of a firm called Lone Star Funds down in Dallas, Texas. Um, they have raised north of a hundred bill, plus billion, and that's a firm where most of their LPs are primarily sovereign wealth funds as well as large endowments and foundations. And so, just given that familiarity with that kind of strategy as well as the legacy of the firm, that is also our LP base um, primarily because they are familiar with the style of, of investing that Lone Star had, and invested with us subsequently thereafter. Um, obviously, it's something that some retail investors and high net worth and family offices may have interest in. However, like from a customer acquisition cost perspective, that's not where the Lone Star name resonates. And so our LP base is primarily the institutional investors of the world. Mm, okay. So institutional investors. So investing in that is almost like buying a call option on rising corporate tax rates. Is that right? Absolutely. So if you think about a net operating loss. Think about that $100 net operating loss as your volume. Think about the tax rate, corporate tax rate as your price. The multiplication of the two is then your revenue. So 100 by today's 21% is $21 of cash flow tax savings. Obviously, to the extent that it went down to, let's say, a 15%, that's $15. If it correspondingly went up to 40%, that's $40. So I think many of our investors view us as a nice hedge in the event that tax rates went down, we obviously have a linear relationship with it on the downwards, um, but that obviously benefits the rest of that portfolio. However, if tax rates were to move up, that obviously hurts that portfolio, but is a benefit to us as a firm. And so in that regard, um, they view us as a nice hedge in the context of a broader book. Mm, brilliant. Okay. Final question for you. How does one start making billions in TRAs? Absolutely. My a close friend of mine loves to joke, um, the more you put in, the more you get out. Obviously, that scale is a big element of that. I think there are a number of elements that I might suggest. The In investing more generally, you need to make several macro as well as micro calls. So from a macro perspective, you need to have four TRAs. You need to have domain expertise. You need to have the go-to-market motion as well as the capacity to underwrite these overall opportunities. Because... Very few things in life are rocket science, with the exception of rocket science itself. And so finding the opportunity whereby you are on the crossroads of of both corporate finance, taxation, as well as commercial capabilities is very challenging. And so in that regards, making a call on a macro is incredibly important. Similarly, on the micro, you need to be able to execute at a very high level. And that is on a day-to-day basis, building relationships such that whenever someone thinks about selling a TRA, that you are first in line. And so those are a number of the elements that I might say allows for one that in time can deliver significant fortunes. And where do you go about finding these people? Like, is it you just go on Edgar and look at people who submit 
intentions to go public or how, how do we how do we find something like that? Yeah, absolutely. As with all things, things are technical. Uh, these are all publicly filed opportunities. And so we have a team in India that basically works through the filings in order to find the underlying data, which allows us to then access the opportunity set. So it's not rocket science to find. It's just long, tedious work in order to scrape the underlying filings to find the right individuals. And subsequent to that, that's where the work starts on our site here in the U.S. Our job then is to reach out and get in front of these holders. That might be via a cold email, a cold call, or if we're fortunate enough to get a warm introduction. Those are some of the formats and avenues through which we've tried to engage with parties writ large. Brilliant. So final thoughts. Is there anything else you would like our our fans around the world to know? Any way to reach out to you? Anything at all? I think there are, in terms of outreach, um, LinkedIn probably is the best avenue for us to engage. Um, we're active on there and looking to meet the smart, hardworking personnel that listen to your show um, in your community. I think there are avenues through which seeking to become educated on the space. Um, you've done a big job in that regard, helping people demystify opportunities. Um, and so I'm very thankful for your time and your audience, sir. Yeah, well, it was certainly great to have you. So just to wrap things up, explore assets on your balance sheet or the balance sheet of others that you're going to make an offer to find ways to liquidate. TRAs are certainly one of those top areas. Focus on cash flow. Cash is king. And if we can do that and really provide, as Andy says, some some intelligent solutions, it's kind of our job. Uh, if we can provide those solutions to unlock value or cash flow at the very least for investors, that is a solution. And finally, invest in funds that do this if you're looking for for a hedge against rising taxes. There's parallel access, there's other ones out there, but really just work with a professional like Andy and his team and you do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. Wow, what a show. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Now, if you haven't done so already, be sure to leave a comment and review on new ideas and guests you want me to bring on for future episodes. Plus, why don't you head over to YouTube and see extra takes while you get to know our guests even better. And make sure to come back for our next episode where we dive even deeper into the people, the process, and the perspectives of both investors and founders. Until then, my friends, stay hungry, focus on your goals, and keep grinding towards your dream of making billions.